Hello and welcome to Research Digest. My name is Jesse Rogers and I'll be talking about math and politics for the next 15 minutes or so. And I usually give this talk to an audience of about 40 to 70 people, so I'm able to get a lot of audience participation and it's really interesting uh, discussions and I hope to replicate that in the comments section of this video. So uh, I really hope to hear from you guys and I'll be asking questions throughout for us to talk about. And the reason why I wanted to do this talk in the first place is because I do like to talk about politics and religion and lots of controversial things with people, but I, I find that I don't always get the results that I want. You know, it seems like uh, uh, if, I, if I talk to somebody with an opposing view, uh, we are very rarely able to find common ground, and, and maybe you've experienced this as well. Um, and so I, I, that led me to become curious about this. Why is that, why is that happening? And, and I stumbled onto uh, something from the Yale Law School called, uh, there's a paper called Motivated Numeracy and Enlightened Self-Government where they explore that. There's two theories. One of those is that uh, people aren't really able to understand the science and that's why there's so much problems. Uh, so that's why they're not agreeing with you is because, uh, you know, we need more education and scientific literacy and, and you know, maybe the, the, uh, public should be making less decisions about things and really it should be left to experts on our, on our most complicated issues. The um, Identity Protective Cognition Thesis, ICT, on the other hand, is uh, taking is a hypothesis with a different approach. It's saying, well, really it's people have the abilities to solve these problems. They have the, the math comprehension and the science comprehension, comprehension by and large, but that uh, ability to process the data and the science is getting disrupted by their ideological commitments and their identities. So in other words, I'm a Republican or I'm a, a liberal or I'm a, a libertarian or a socialist or whatever it is, that identity is is disrupting their ability to just fairly and, and rationally and uh, effectively analyze data. So the, the uh, way to deal with that would be to protect and decontaminate decision making from divisiveness and cultural identity. Now, this is the first question I'd like to pose to you guys. If this, let's suppose this hypothesis is true, how do you go about doing that? It's not as easy as just raising education dollars at, or, or, you know, heightening standards or whatever you want to, whatever you want to do to, to improve education. No, this is, it seems like a harder problem if this one's the, the true one. So, I'd be curious to hear what you what thoughts you guys have, and, and I'm not saying it can't be done, but but um, I do want to explore this. So leave your comments uh, in the comments section there. I'd, I'd be interested. Now, how did they go about measuring this to find out which one of those things was true? Well, first, what they did is they they established how good people are at solving these kinds of math problems, um, and they also had them ident self identify liberal or conservative on, on that spectrum. And then they gave them a problem like this. Now this is what the control group would have seen. Um, they actually all got a, a, a same version of this. Uh, everybody who participated in this study saw these numbers, but they had different, um, different text here. So th the control group got something very neutral about a skin cream and whether the rash got better or worse as a result of using that skin cream. So take a minute and, and try to make sense of this problem. Do you think, just from from what you can see here, uh, did the skin cream work? Would you want to use the skin cream? Now, if you notice, the, the patients who used the skin cream and got better, that's the biggest group. So this is the plurality here of 223. That's, that's larger than any of these other groups. And But the patients who did not use the skin cream, that's also, it's actually a lot larger than the rash got worse group, right? So if that, that's that's kind of the hint of how to do this, is that you total these numbers up, and you do 223 divided by the total, and that tells you about 74% of people got better by using the skin cream. Whereas this part uh, would be 84%, because you're going to take the 107 and divide it by the total of these two things added together, and, and you get 84%. So it's actually better not to use the skin cream. You have a, not only does it not work, it actually decreases your likelihood of uh, uh, the rash getting better. So... Uh, what they did is they gave the same sort of scenario to um, in, in four different ways. The rash got worse, rash got better, 
increase in crime or decrease in crime, and and they, um, so so the the skin cream that was the neutral that was the control group, right? The experimental group was was given a question about conceal carry handguns in public. What effect would that have, or did that have? Not would it, but did it have? And because uh, the numbers are right here. Now these aren't real numbers, but the participants don't know that. So how did they model this? Well. As you might expect, the people who don't know how to solve these problems, they are, this is the numeracy scale down here, uh, so you know 0 to 5, they don't really know how to solve this problem very reliably. From 0 to 1, this is how reliably they, they were able to interpret the data correctly. So uh, uh, 1 means they were able to solve it every time, and down here means about half the people were able to solve it and half weren't. So you know, less than half the people solve it if their numeracy is low. But for the people in the eights and nines, you know, they were able to solve this problem pretty reliably. They knew how to, they knew what to do, and it didn't matter what their political affiliation was. Red is the conservatives, blue is the liberals. They're all able to solve. They they know how to solve these problems if they have high numeracy. Now, this is crazy. Look at what happens when you introduce a a politically charged concept like gun control. Now you see such separation. These these groups that were able to get it correct in high numeracy, they were uh, uh, given given data that was consistent with their ideology. So, you know, they're definitely able to solve it when that happens. But when it conflicts with their ideology, look at what happens. So this group, these eight, these are eights and nines, but they're not able to solve it any more reliably, and actually maybe even less in some cases less reliably than the, the groups that were, uh, you know, in low numeracy. So uh, what happens here is is that, you know, clearly our ability to comprehend math concepts is getting disrupted by our political affiliation or our ideological commitments. And uh, th then there's, there's a question that the authors raised about that. Is that irrational? Is, is, are people being irrational when they're not... Um, accurately or effectively reliably solving these problems and they argue that the answer is actually no this is the scary thing um, it is perfectly rational from an individual welfare perspective for individuals to engage in decision decision relevant science in a manner to, that promotes culturally or politically congenial beliefs so what that means uh, let, well, let me give you an example suppose that you're a coal miner your dad's a coal miner grandfather's a coal miner you live in a coal miner town are you going to spend a lot of your time getting worked up about global warming? That kind of seems like a bad idea, doesn't it? When everyone you love and care about is 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 committed to not having an engaging to a conversation about uh, uh, climate change. Or imagine that all of your friends uh, uh, think Trump is a bigot and don't like him, and you know all all sorts of stuff like that. And then you go around saying, you know, I think he's a pretty good businessman, and I really like Trump. I, I think I'm going to vote for him. There is a social cost to that, right? I mean, it's 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 rational from an individual perspective, regardless of what the truth is or isn't. It it, it makes sense from an individual's standpoint to have uh, uh, political beliefs that are not going to uh, uh, cost them friends and family. Now, how many of you have been unfriended by people on on Facebook? You know, you can you can just imagine having strong opinions can uh, uh, can can carry carry a cost. So uh, they they said another piece here that I thought was was interesting. Ideologically motivated reasoning is not a form of bounded rationality or limited rationality, whatever you want to call it, but instead a sign of how it becomes rational for otherwise intelligent people to use their critical faculties when they find themselves in the unenviable situation of having to choose between crediting the best available evidence or simply being who they are. Now, I do have some hope here because I think who we are changes. I know that from my own personal experience, I've changed my mind about many things. Maybe not in real time. I mean, I still, in the moment, tried to win the argument, whether, you know, whatever the data showed. But but then on reflection, I was like, you know, I don't really agree with what I was saying now. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Why did I say that? And, and so I, I do think that we can, it, it is possible to, to change our mindsets. I know I'm not the only one who, who has been able to do this. There, but um, uh, it certainly isn't easy, and it certainly doesn't happen as often as maybe it should. And so uh, the bottom line here, though, from this study is that political identity, having deep convictions, 
uh, really sh shatters our ability to reliably assess information. And, and so that's, that's certainly a problem. Um, you know, there were about half the people got, that got it right, even when it did conflict with their uh, ideologies, but um, it, it was no longer reliable that just having high numeracy would be enough to uh, help people get the problem right. Uh, but I don't want to be completely dismissive of SCT either. I do think that there are, there are problems with people not understanding math and science concepts well enough. And uh, Jeremy Teitelbaum, who is a dean at the University of Connecticut, had on his blog three areas where he thought that um, uh, policy decision making is, is hampered by the general public's um, you know, problems with math. And so... Let's let's go into that. The first one is about exponential growth. Now, Einstein was once asked, uh, or so, so the story goes anyway, um, what the most powerful force in the universe was. And everybody, since he's a physicist, expected him to say something like gravity or electromagnetism or something like that. And he said compound interest. And th so that's the joke, right? Uh, compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe. And, and so he, here he's talking about um, man-made forces of finance and, and but you can see just how incredible this can get uh, this red line represents our productivity as a society our GDP in other words and this blue line is representing our debt our government debt so you know what what's happening here is that the separation between how productive we are and and therefore the taxes we're able to collect and how much we're debt we're taking out it is is just mind-boggling. It's it's getting really problematic because a larger and larger slice of the pie is having to go towards paying interest, not not paying down debt, but just paying interest on that debt. And so this is the reason why, for example, the the Tea Party was willing to shut down the government to to halt this growth. So whether you agree with their methods, you know, and and how that translates into to real world, you know, people's lives are on the line kind of stuff. You know, however you feel about that, the the problem that they are addressing here is worth taking seriously, and and I think that we we really need to do a lot more of that, um, and and I fear that that it doesn't get enough uh, uh, attention and and uh, there's not enough awareness of this, and and so exponential growth is one of those one of those concepts. Another place where it shows up is in CO two emissions. You can see this exponential growth just rocketing up with China um, and of course the United States since since this chart begins in the 19 in the year 1900 US has always been dominant and, and on top and China is only recently pumping out as much co2 as we are and you know they still have a long way to go before they've caught up to the total amount of co2 that we've put into the atmosphere but they're catching up to it pretty quickly because of this exponential growth so something to be uh, aware of here as well now, as far as risk assessment, okay, which one of these things is really going to kill you? Right? I mean, if you watch, if you watch uh, uh, cable news or you're watching, you know, CNN, uh, MSNBC, Fox News, uh, listening to the to the uh, candidates for for the presidency, terrorism takes up such a disproportionate amount of our attention. It's not to say that it's not a serious problem and there are people that die from it, but in terms of serious problems, it's nothing compared to heart disease in terms of the number of people that die from it, or it's nothing compared to obesity-related diseases or uh, cancers or, I mean, uh, for goodness sakes, you're 14 times more likely to die from fireworks than from terrorists. So for those who are really interested in saving American lives, you know, I, I credit Michelle Obama and Jamie Oliver and folks like this that have, that have focused on nutrition and food and, and, and schools and things like that. I think that's a much more uh, effective place to put our attention. And, and the last point to make here is that math is everywhere. You're affected by algorithms. You're, every, everything in, in your life is being described and understood in mathematical terms. And uh, so, you know, you really just cannot underestimate how important math is it, it's it's something that you can't turn a blind eye to so i hope you've enjoyed this video I, I hope it's it's giving you some things to think about i really hope to hear from your from you guys in the comments section and uh stay tuned subscribe if you want to see more videos like this um or or give it a like if you enjoyed 
and uh, I, I look forward to seeing you next time.